before we have children, we need to prepare. And the best uh, physical preparation that parents can do is really adhere to those eight laws of health so that their bodies are strong and healthy and they're giving a better gene pool to their children. Spiritually is very important because our, our moods, our emotion, even our personality, our character, you know, the research is showing today even that is coming through with the children. And also wisdom and guidance from God. The Bible has some, <coughs> excuse me, excellent, excellent guidance. I think Philippians chapter 2 is is a good one where the Bible says let each esteem the other better than themselves great great advice for for young parents and also in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 33 where the Bible says that the husbands the man is to love his wife as himself and also see that the wife reverence her husband this really needs to be established before having children because that will greatly affect parenting. All, all through the Proverbs there is excellent advice on, on raising children to train up a child in the way he should go. And that's um, Proverbs 22, I think it's verse 6. And how do you train up a child in the way that they should go? with very simple Bible principles and we touched on them in our in our previous presentation. Also the book Child Guidance by Ellen White was very very helpful to me. I used to ever read it. I tried to read a paragraph a day and the section that helped me the most I think was the the paramount task of character building. That's an excellent one. I also have found that the book um, Have a New Kid by Friday, written by Keith Lehman, has some very practical advice. Um, I found that even non-Christians um, benefit from that book. And of course to the Christian, absolutely the Bible and the, the book The Child Guidance, also Adventist Home by Ellen White, has some great advice in preparation. But I deal with a lot of people who aren't Adventists, who aren't Christians, and they find that reading a little bit hard, they find it a bit difficult, and I really believe that the Holy Spirit um, is, is required to be able to understand the words of God, absolutely. And so for people who probably are more likely to read um, you know, a book from another author, the book Have a New Kid by Friday, excellent advice. In fact, it, it would help every single person to read that book. Again, very practical advice, and that's what a lot of people are looking for, more practical advice. I think it's a good idea to wait two years, and um, I have read some uh, doctors and naturopaths who advise waiting two years. Two years is a good amount of time, a good amount of time to to get the body ready, even for the young couple to go to through a cleanse, maybe a few days on juices and making sure their bowels are working well and establishing right, it's a great way to, to re-establish right habits in the way of eating and drinking um, by beginning with a couple of days on fruit and vegetable juices but I also think it's important for a young couple to establish themselves. One man said to me that the first year of married life was the worst for him. <laughs> I think it can be quite a confronting experience suddenly um, living with someone else. I was going to say a stranger but then I guess you don't marry a stranger. <laughs> Even, even people that appear to know each other quite well, when they start living together, it can be a, a different kettle of fish, as we say in Australia. Uh, one, one lady said that 
it just really annoyed her the way her husband just threw the clothes on the floor. He wouldn't put the lid down, <coughs> excuse me, on the toilet seat. And one couple f had little arguments about which way the toilet paper should go on the, on the round. Um, one man said it, it really annoyed him the way his wife would just keep the fridge door open as she was getting things out to, to cook. She should shut the... See, all these little tiny things, they, they, they build up. And our lives are made up of little tiny things. And when, when you marry, it's important to realise that you will, you will marry to serve. Now, if both the man and the woman have an attitude to serve, things will go a lot, a lot smoother. And so if the lady thinks to herself, oh, how kind of my husband to put his clothes together for me to wash, rather than getting annoyed that he's thrown them on the floor. And the fact that the toilet seat's open, she can have a little laugh and say, ha, that's what a lot of men do. <laughs> it's easy for me to close. And even both saying it doesn't matter what's, what way the toilet paper is on the, on the roll. And, you know, the husband realising that it doesn't make a big difference if the fridge door's open for a minute or 10 seconds. So what are all these? These are little changes of attitude and, submit, attitude and also submitting, I'm with another person now and they like this way and I might like, might, might like this way. And also asking God for patience and for wisdom. Unfortunately, when a young couple's courtship has been uh, out to dinner and walking along the sand hand in hand and everything's just been so lovely and then, and then the build up to the wedding is exciting and the honeymoon is just beautiful. And then back home, back to work. <laughs> and one lady said she had to go and tend her daughter every day. She would just stay in bed all day. You know, her husband came home a little cranky and he got annoyed if the dinner wasn't ready and he got annoyed in the morning if there wasn't a shirt ready for him and whoa, we call it the rubber hits the road. <laughs> One lady said, well, my husband should be doing half the cooking. And I said to her, do you know my husband's very good at cooking toast? That's it, <laughs> toast. <laughs> but you know, I don't mind because he does so much on the outside. He does all the mowing and the whippersnipping. That's the weed cutting. He does, he does so much that, that I'm very happy to do all the cooking. <laughs> And a lady says, well, what if I don't like cooking? I say, well, you can learn to love it. <laughs> and one lady said, well, my husband's on the computer all day and he doesn't mow the lawn. And so I said to her, do you know it's quite fun mowing the lawn? <laughs> it's, it's, it's that first year, ideally two, of just learning about each other, getting to know what's important for the other person. My husband does not like my plants, and I have plants everywhere. I love plants. But you know that I'm away now and he's watering my plants. <laughs> so it's, it's just living together and giving a little bit. So a couple of years to learn that is, is a nice time. Husbands must go first. That's absolute. So again, it's knowing what's important to your husband. What's very important to my husband is that the meal is hot. The meal is on time. One lady said that she was so busy one afternoon and her husband was due home and she hadn't ha put the meal on. So she ran in, put the oven on, put an onion in the oven and went back to her work. And the husband came in so happy that he could smell <laughs> this cooked onion. <laughs> And then she knew that she could quickly put the meal together in 15 minutes. But she had a happy husband because he could smell the onion cooking. It's, it's very important to know what's important. If it's very important for the husband that he have iron shirts, she must iron his shirts. She'll find a spot in the day. 
And it's very important when the husband comes home that what he first sees is tidy, even if everything's been thrown into another room, because he's had a hard day. So it's important, and it's important as soon as he comes in to smile and say, it's so good to see you. I've been waiting for this moment all day. And you might say, well, that sounds like lying. No, it's not lying because this is the man you love. And even if you don't feel it, sometimes you must. You must love him. And God will give you the grace to do that. And if it looks like the baby's very demanding and you might not get the tea on on time and it's a few hours away, maybe you could ring up for takeaways. Maybe you could ring up a friend and say, do you mind quickly putting a meal together for me? Some husbands don't mind coming home and putting the meal together. So it's just knowing what's important to the husband. But the wife must be mindful of this. She will not have a jealous husband then. And he will understand if the baby's been very demanding that day. Maybe she had cabbage the day before and the baby's a little, <coughs> what we call fussy, <laughs> needing a little bit more attention. But if she puts her concentrations on her husband, um, she will have a happy, happy husband. And what if the baby's been very demanding and the wife's been with the baby all day long and the husband comes home and she says, it's your turn now. That won't go very well with the husband. She's far better to when he walks in the, day, in the door say, hello sweetheart, I've been so looking forward to your coming home. And he'll say, have you had a good day? She said, actually, it's been a little challenging. <laughs> she might even burst into tears at that point and say, I haven't even done the washing. And at that point, he possibly will say, can I help? And at that point, she can say, would you mind just taking the baby for half an hour? And he will. But if she doesn't know if he's had a very challenging day, she doesn't know if he's had problem after problem after problem, and he comes in the door and he just wants a little rest. That's why before a wife does that, she feels her way. And, she, and if he, she says, I've had a tough day, he said, I'm, he might say, I'm sorry to hear that. I've had a tough day too. And she said, I'd love it if you could give me a break from the baby, but would you like a shower first? Would you like to put, put your feet up for her? <laughs> you see the difference? Then the husband coming in and the wife saying, take this baby. <laughs> because sometimes, <coughs> the wife's had a hard day, the husband's had a hard day, they meet at the door and explosions. <laughs> and of course, when the baby picks that up, the baby starts screaming even more. So it's just, remember what the Bible says, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Let each be mindful that the other has had a hard day. But the way things work today, there's text messages. <laughs> and maybe the husband can forewarn and the wife can forewarn. Do you know, the genes can be strong, but with, pair, with patient, loving guidance, <coughs> guidance, even they can be guided aright. Yesterday I talked about a vine around a tree. It's like the will. It must not be pulled and forced into going around that tree or it'll break. And it can't be left to go wherever it will or it'll hardly ever get around the tree. But if you patiently guide it every day, guide it this way, come back again, it's gone away, guide it again. Come back the next day, it's gone away, guide it again. That can be totally prevented. I have to tell you, we never had jealousy. And I'll tell you why because I went to great steps to prevent it. So before the baby is born, that little one put the touch and feel the baby and the baby's about to be born and then the mother goes through her birth. <coughs> I was privileged that in my fourth birth, 
my other two little children watch the birth because I have read when the children watch the birth it's really cemented that this baby came out of the mother because often the mother appears with something new <laughs> And of course that can't always happen. Some parents aren't comfortable with that happening and I totally understand that. But if the little one is coming into the room to see the baby for the first time, I, was, I read that the baby should be on the bed or in a cot. And then the mother opens her arms wide and takes the little one and says, you've got a new baby sister you've got a new baby brother, look. And together they view the baby. And so that little one now feels a very important part, but there's a new one coming in. And when I ever fed the baby, because that takes all your attention, you've got to sit. I always had a pile of books and I'd push the baby to the side and I'd pull the little one over. Which book would you like? And, and I'd give all the attention to the little one. No attention to the baby. <laughs> and then it comes time to talk to the baby. <laughs> and it's so lovely to talk to babies. And they look at time? you, they smile, probably from, you know, they're starting to respond at a few weeks. And then at about two months, they make little coos and little, and if you're doing all the talking to the baby and the little one's left out, I always think, how will they feel? So when I talk to the baby, say it's baby James and there's little Emma. They were my first two. I'd say, instead of saying, oh, you are the most beautiful baby, I'd say, did you know you've got a big sister? Did you know what your big sister can do? And the baby doesn't know what I'm saying, but I'm looking and talking. But then that little one's happy because I'm talking about the little one. Do you know she's the best helper for her mother? Did you know what she did the other day? She opened the door when I brought the washing in. And then you know what she did? <coughs> Can you see what you're doing? You're reinforcing the whole time. So when I go to a family to see a new baby, I look, I look for the little one. I look for the little two-year-old. And I go in and say, do you have a new brother or sister? Can you show me? You see what I do? Whereas I see this happen. <coughs> All attention's on the toddler. Baby comes. Everyone puts all their attention on the baby. No wonder the toddler's upset. But it can easily be prevented. And I've always been very shy. And I've always been a watcher. And I've been always shy to speak. I can speak now because I, God has called me to do that for a purpose. And when you're a listener and a watcher, you see things, you watch things. And I used to think, no wonder the child's upset. <laughs> all the attention was on him, now it's all there. <laughs> to me, that's like one and one equals two. Of course that's gonna happen. And what some people do <coughs> is the little boy, when his new sister comes, he'll get a new truck. And if it's a little girl, she'll get a new baby. And I had little books by Eloise Wilkins. She's an author and an illustrator from about the 50s. And they're called little golden books. And they're beautiful little books and they were books about the new baby arrives and little Tommy got a truck and then there's another book called Baby Deer and with Baby Deer everything mother does this little girl does with Baby Deer and she washes Baby Deer when mother washes hers and she rocks the baby to sleep while mama wash, rocks baby to sleep she does everything so that also helps and the last page is baby deer's on the floor and this little girl is holding her little brother or sister. So books like that also help. They show that, you know, this is a new little treasure uh, in your home. So if it's handled right, there need be no problems.
I'll tell you something that a lady told me. She had three brothers, all fairly close, two years apart, and then five years later she was born. So these parents had three boys, then a little girl. Oh, how they loved that little girl. So I said, oh, your parents must have loved you. She said they did. They totally indulged me. They totally spoiled me. And as soon as their backs were turned, my brothers were so cruel to me. Now, who orchestrated that? It was the parents. <laughs> I remember at one stage, my son Peter, when he was about 16, he used to say, Mum, I'm your favourite son, aren't I? I'm your favourite son. And I'd say, yes, you're my favourite son, and James is my favourite son, and William is my favourite son. <laughs> and I would laugh, and he'd say, Mum. <laughs> so it's important that all be equal, but it is also important that if a child has a birthday, all the other siblings, they make little presents for that person. So there's no jealousy, because the Bible said it is better to give than receive. They, they feel the joy of seeing that little one get a present. And it's understood that at someone's birthday, they get something. And so we, we never had, um, had jealousy there. So in all my children too, if they wanted something, they needed to work for it. And I remember my two little boys, they must have been uh, probably seven and nine. They wanted a little toolkit. Um, and it was in a hardware shop and it was quite good. It was a metal hammer and things like that. So he went in and they lay by it. Do you have lay by here? Every week the little boys come in and pay another 20 cents. Mm. And then the next week they might be able to pay 50 cents. And the people in the shop, they were so taken with this that when they only had 50 cents to go, the people in the shop said, they can have them now. Okay. Oh, my little boys were so happy. And when they took that home, oh, they value that because they have worked hard for it. So we never gave our children gifts. They, they would work. They would work for it and, and they would earn it. And when they earn it, oh, they value that very much. What work do you pay for the children and what work don't you? At a certain age, um, I guess maybe from about, it's hard for me to say, maybe seven or eight, the children can have, be given a little allowance every week. And they're given that little allowance as part of the family team. As part of the family team, they make their bed, they keep their room clean, they put their clothes away, they wash the dishes, they dry the dishes, they sweep the floor. That's all part of the family team. Now, you never pay a child for that because who pays the mother? It's part of the family team. But maybe washing the car, maybe um, collecting cow manure for the garden, um, there might be a payment for that. And uh, maybe, uh, but in the garden, the garden was part of our, part of being part of the family team too, because they're eating the vegetables out of the garden. So, but then again, I, what I used to do to encourage my children, because no child wants usually to work in the garden. <laughs> So you've got to make it fun. So I would give them responsibility. So James was in charge of the cucumbers. He could do the cucumbers, the watermelons and the pumpkins. So each child had a vegetable. And I found that then they put a lot of effort into it and they could sell the excess. And when James was, I think he was 14, he had enough money saved up to buy a, a mountain bike. And we went to the shop to put a down payment on it. I think, well, he had enough for the down payment, not quite, but we could start. <coughs> and he op opened his purse and all these two dollar coins fell out. And the man looked at me and I said, it's his cucumber money. And he said, 
this boy will value that bike. And he's right. And James is 40, I think he's 45. No, he's 43. James is 43. And that bike is still at our property. <laughs> he, he valued that bike. So this is, this is something that the, um, that the, I guess the parents need to come together and, and, and work out that and also having family conferences where the children put their input. We were gathering cow manure one day with my, my grandson and he was gathering and I was grand gathering and I think he was about 12 and he said, Grandma, how, how much will you pay me if I get three buckets? I said, well, you have to work very hard because I have to work very hard for my money. <laughs> and he nodded. <laughs> so if we we're all getting cow manure, I might say, everyone gets me a lot. In fact, I think I did this at one point. Everyone gets me a cow manure of, a wheelbarrow load of cow manure every week. Any extra, I'll pay. And it's the same with picking the little tomatoes, picking tiny toms, you know, about, they're about the size of grapes. No one wants to do it because it's tedious. So I'd say every child is to pick me a little bucket, that's about a two cup size a day. Any after that, I'll pay. So we, we had systems like that. And the other thing we did for the garden, especially in the summer when it's hot in the day, we did our breakfast <clears throat> and then one child would stay in and clean up the breakfast, do the dishes. Then the rest of us would go out and we'd garden for half an hour before school. The next day, another child would be in the kitchen and the rest of us would go out. So I guess when you've got, well, the youngest one was a bit little, say about five children. Everyone just has one day in the breakfast room and everyone else is outside. So you, you, you make sure you're fair. The one thing that will anger children if they think it's unjust or it's not fair and so and I think that's what the Bible means when it says fathers don't stir up anger in your children what stirs anger up in children is unfairness so you must must always be fair must always have your mind on on where every child you know how, how they are with every situation not much not much my daughter Emma, she, she's in the US. Her children are mostly grown, some of them are little. But when her first ones were little, her um, American in-laws would come to the birthday party with piles of presents. And when they drove away, Emma waved, she put everything in the car, take it back to the shops and get the money back on it. You can do that in the US. But she started to talk to them as the children were getting older and she said uh, um, books and uh, money maybe for their account or if they needed some shoes or something like that, something useful. But I certainly think children can have far too many toys. They can as long as they're kind and they will find if they're kind and if they're fair the other children don't mind. The only time the other children don't mind is if they're, if, if they're cruel or mean or unjust. So that the mother needs to, to have her mind on that. I used to lay my babies down in their own bed for the first part of the night. And then when they woke, then I would bring them in. <clears throat> has to be what the mother and father are happy with. Some fathers do not want the baby in the bed. Um, some mothers, <coughs> they say they can't sleep. The baby in the bed, you have to do what works. But I used to ease my little ones into their own bed from about two, and we make it quite a, a big deal. They've got their own bed now, and you might go out together or I used to make a lot of things. They would choose the material and we make a special cover for the bed and et cetera, et cetera. I know um, my son Peter and his wife, they, they would get the baby into their own bed, you know, quite early. So I remember being at their house and uh, 
rocking the little one to bed in the rocking chair and easing him into his own cot. And if he woke in the night, I think they would just pat him back to sleep. Some babies just will go. Some babies just automatically sleep through the night. Um, but what the mother has to be mindful that the woman can handle being woken several times in the night much better than the man can. And the man is working all day, so I say, let, let the lady get up and tend the little one. And also, of course, she's got the milk. <laughs> but um, she can have a little nap in the day when the baby has a little nap if, if she has been woken a bit in the night. I, I, I know some families where they're still laying down and with the child to put them to sleep when they're six, seven, eight and nine, I think that's a little over the top. <laughs> I don't think there's a, there's a need for that. It's got to be a balance. When I was young, I, um, I studied psychiatry for a while. I was a psychiatric nurse. And we learned that there are three things that children can, can have a battle over. One is toilet, one is food, and one is sleep. And so I made a point of never making a fuss over toilet, bed, or sleep. And <coughs> it's good to let the child come in with you when you go to the toilet. And I would always smile and, you know, so they see that's what you do, that's where you go. I found they want to be with you anyway. I remember when I minded a few extra children, I had three and I minded four more, and they all wanted to come with me. <laughs> so it was much easier to have them all in there with me than have the door shut with them all crying at the door. <laughs> so, you know, and it's something they see, that's how they learn, they learn to see. And we lived out in the bush, so the father would take the little one out and we'd call it the father's watering the garden. <laughs> but we, we always taught them to to you know that their private parts must be must be kept covered so if they do do that they go behind a tree away from people and it's much easier if it's summertime because then I would just not have you know I just have a top on the little one and then when something happens they feel it and then I never ever uh, uh, I never was upset or angry I would, I would just clean it up and say, next time, go out on the grass. I would just say that. This is not something that you punish the child for. Because I, I've known people, their, their baby's still in the diaper at three, three and a half. You know, that's quite, quite a long time. So it's, um, some children are easier than others. I know my third child, she was 18 months and she was wanting to sit on the pot. Whereas her brother, two more children later, he was about two and a half. But he never, he never make a fuss. And some children wet the bed till a late age, but you never make a fuss about that. But if they wet the bed, they clean it up. But you never ever say anything because they're already embarrassed about it. You say, okay, take the sheets off and put them in the washing machine. And when the washing machine's finished, Okay, we'll hang them on the line and you might help them if they're little. So it's, it's realising that, you know, when they're getting to nine, ten and still wetting the bed, um, that can be very embarrassing for them. And you see, they're sound asleep. As one girl said to me, I used to go to sleep, dreamt that I'd go into the toilet, wake up with a wet bed. You know, there's not a conscious thing there. So it's, it's, it's being mindful of that. Now one lady said to me, <laughs> her little boy is two and a half, still has a night diaper on, and she knows that when he wakes up, he just has a wet diaper. And when she goes into him, she notices that he's done a poo. So you see, that's a choice that that child has done because he is toilet trained. It's just that at night he has that. She said, what do I do? Because you, you never punish them for that. That's something that you never do with the, with the toilet. You have to 
gently guide them. And I said, tell me what he has for breakfast. <coughs> he was a <coughs> child that had a gluten tolerance. He had a <coughs> millet porridge for breakfast. Then he loved two rice cakes with tahini and honey. I said, okay, well tell him that if he does that again, he does not have his rice cakes with tahini and honey. It never happened again. <laughs> so you're not depriving him of his breakfast. He's still having his breakfast, but he's not having that, that little thing that he likes. So it's just simple, it's just cause and effect. And another mother told me that her little uh, two, you know, again, two, two and a half, they're still getting it together. Every morning he'd go and squat on the step and do his poo there. And I said, what do you do? She said, well, I hose it off and I take him into the bathroom and I give him a hot shower. I said, no, no hot shower, cold hose outside. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. Oh, sorry, sweetheart, but you're a bit dirty. I gotta wash you. <laughs> oh, what about the hot shower? No, we've got no time for that. <laughs> See, you, you, you're not angry, you, you never do that. Well, it didn't happen again because he didn't want that cold. <laughs> <laughs> that cold hose off. There, you see, it's just cause and effect. So when a little one's starting to toilet train, you just have a lot of little pants. <laughs> a lot of little pants. Well, with the food, there's just rules. It's lunchtime, everyone sits at the table. Mm. If the child cried at the table, they had to leave the table. If they said, I don't want that, I'd say, well, you, you'll have to leave but not to go and play, to have to go and sit outside. And then there's nothing till the next meal. And they're, they're very hungry, so you just keep giving them water. You don't feed them between, because it doesn't hurt them to get a bit hungry. And you don't say, well, if you'd eaten all your lunch, you wouldn't be hungry now. See, that's implying that they're an idiot. They know that. And so you, you don't have to nag or harp on about that because that never helps. The next meal they'll eat very well. And they're smart. Children are very smart. They, they'll get it together. They work it out. And there was a rule at our home. <laughs> there was no bread until you'd eaten all your vegetables and your salad. So there, you have rules in the home and you're very nice. Um, but if a child makes a fuss, they must leave. And when I heard they'd stop crying, I'd say, would you like to come back now? Or I'd say, are you going to be a good boy now? Okay, come back. You see, you treat them well. And if I opened the door and said, are you going to come back now? And they screamed out, no! Oh, you shut the door. They stay out there. And they haven't eaten since the last meal, so you know they're hungry. And then five minutes later, I try again. Are you going to be a good boy now? And when they say yes, they've just acknowledged they were not, they were not a good boy. <laughs> so you, you, um, you keep the table happy place for the sake of everyone's digestion. And I've had people say to me, Barbara, I thank you so much for taking that child out. You know, because it's making a fuss, you just quickly take it out. And for bed. I find that children will happily go to bed when it's the same time every day. So I notice my daughter-in-law, she gets her little ones to bed early. And, she, and if she wants them in bed by 6.30, she starts at 4.30. So starts the bath at 4.30, then they have, then they finish the bath by maybe 5. And then uh, at 5.30 they have a light tea. And then they go straight from the tea, or maybe they'll have their tea first, either tea or bath. Then they go straight from tea or straight from bath into the bedroom. And then they get in their pajamas there, and there's a soft light, and then the story's read, and a, maybe a song. I always let my grandchildren choose a story each and a song each. And then, then they go to sleep, so it's routine. But I remember I used to say to my son James, who could be very challenging, I'd say to him, are you going to take your bear or your elephant to bed tonight? So the message is, you're going to bed. But you're giving them a choice. 
It's like you never say to a child, what do you want for breakfast? You serve the breakfast. And then you say to the child, would you like a banana or a pear on your breakfast? There's their choice. Would you like soy milk or almond milk on your breakfast? There's the choice. So when you give them a choice, they, they feel like they've got a little power there. <laughs> I think I would. I have a friend who lives in Aachen and they bought a house, I think it's in Belgium, is that just across the border? Mm -hmm. And it's only half an hour to work and now they homeschool. But they're in Germany most of the time. <laughs> and they homeschool in Germany, but they live <laughs> just across the border. Um, I think so because especially today in Australia, it's just terrible what's happening in the schools. We've had teachers do our program and they tell us that they're not allowed to call the girls girls and the boys boys now. And they're supposed to teach that girls should try boys and girls and boys should try boys and girls. It's, it's um, really severe what's happening in the schools. And because of the technology, in some schools the child can't do school unless they've got an iPad. And so that introduces the child now to, to a whole nother world. And the Russian standards for technology are under the age of two, no, no exposure to technology. I think it's under the age of seven, something like five minutes. Under the age of 10, maybe 15 minutes a day. By the time they're 15, maybe an hour a day. By the time they're 18, maybe three hours a day. So this is, whew. Now most people in these developed countries, are, they, they put their eyes down when you tell them about those guidelines because so many parents, they give the child the, the technology to keep them quiet. And then when you try and take the technology off, whoa, we've got screams and all sorts of things happening. That's when the tantrums happened. Oh, there's some good cures for tantrums. And it's a bucket of cold water. Excellent cure. And when, but I wouldn't do it in the lounge room. I'd sort of veer the child outside, then whoosh, throw the bucket of cold water on. Tantrums. Uh, screaming and ah. crying on the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You, they must never, ever exhibit such behavior. Okay. Never. But a, my husband says that his daughter, Michaela, when she was three, she did a tantrum. That's what we call a tantrum, throwing on the ground. He said, it hurt her so much, she never did that again. <laughs> and they don't like the bucket of cold water. Well, some parents will put the child in the bath and put the cold shower on. They'll scream, but it's a scream. But then you'll say, I, are you going to stop now? Yes. Oh, turn, the, turn it off. Can you see that? You, you don't get angry. You must never get angry. Because then you teach them anger. If the child does that in the supermarket, you must leave immediately. You'll want to, because it's very embarrassing. And so this is what I said to one mother. I said, just leave the supermarket. She said, but my trolley's half full. I said, you haven't paid for it, doesn't matter. And take the child and say, we're going. But the child throws himself on the ground. And so you give the child the opportunity to get up, but they don't. So you just drag them. And people will be looking at you, smile. Just smile and say, he likes being dragged. It's his favorite way to move along. As long as you're smiling, if you're angry, then, you know, the, and then you get outside to the gutter and you give them an opportunity to get up. Would you like to get an up and walk now? No! Okay. And you hold them by the wrist and you pull them. If they resist, it hurts them. Make the wrist strong. But if they come with you, you relax the wrist. It's very much like the horse with the bit in its mouth. Mm. <laughs> and then you get into the car and you strap them into their car and then you go home. And then you take them out of the car and you go inside and you say, sweetheart, that wasn't very good, was it? 
You didn't like it. I didn't like it. So you're not going to come shopping with me next time because I never want that to happen again. You see, they're feeling bad now. They're feeling a little bit guilty. So there's no need to say much more. Just say that that's not going to happen again. So maybe the next day you have to go back and shop and you arrange for him to be minded. And, uh, and then you'll say, because the next day he'll say, I'm so sorry, Mum, can I come? Maybe next time, but not this time, because of what, what you just did. And then you go and you come back, and then a week later, you say, I'm going shopping today. And the child looks at you, and you say, you can come, but if you put on a performance like you did last time, um, we will again leave immediately and you will not come with me again till you can prove to me that you're big enough to be able to behave well. Can you see that? You're not putting the child down because you put a child down, you never get anywhere. God doesn't do that to us. He just says, come unto me. But there's clear lines. There's clear lines. It was very easy at my house because we lived on a farm and the children saw the horses and the cows and the, <laughs> and the chooks, we call them chickens. Also, they saw their baby brother being born. And we had books. And the books showed the baby in the womb. And, it, and I'll, I'll tell you um, something that happened. My, I dropped my at a friend who's a homeschool, this is when I was a single mother, I dropped my little six and eight year old at her house and she had two the same age for half a day while I did the shopping. And when I came back she said, your son gave my children sex education classes today. And I thought, oh dear, what has Peter said? She said, um, her son said, you get babies by kissing. And, and Peter said, chickens don't kiss. <laughs> that was the sex education class. <laughs> and I know that when the, when the father duck was on the mother duck, my little William, I think he was only four or five, you know, the father duck pecks the mother on the back of the head. William would run and push the duck off and take the mother duck and run away. So they're automatically getting a little bit of an education uh, on the farm. <laughs> and I used to say to my children when they get a little bigger, I'd say, and often you do it when they ask questions. I'd say, father puts a seed inside mother and the seed connects with the mother's seed and the baby starts to grow. That's one of the first explanations that, that I would give. And I found that's a nice one. I'd say mother has a blood nest that builds up in her every month. And if father hasn't put a seed in there, the blood nest comes away. And then that explains why the children might see a bit of blood, you know, especially when you're living very closely with your children. And I would say, oh, it's just the blood nest. So you have very simple illustrations and you say it very nicely um, with no bad connotations around it. Then they, um, then as they get older, their understanding develops. And again, you keep the doors open so they can talk to you. I never ever talked any deeper than that with the children. <laughs> if they'd asked, I, um, my husband, he said that with his two children, he'd say, when mummy and daddy are in bed together, something happens and uh, the babies come. And he said, after he told that to his little boy and girl, his little boy didn't want to get in bed and cuddle with his sister anymore <laughs> in case a baby came. <laughs> but you'll find that as they grow, their understanding deepens. Yeah, that's very, very difficult. And I guess that's why I would go to great lengths to homeschool my children. Because the influence of friends, 
Whew. You know, Ellen White says, have your eye on your children all the time, but don't let them know you have your eye on them. And I, I certainly did that. And I gave the story in one of the classes last week that a, a woman came to me and they live way out in the country, homeschool their children, Seventh Day Adventist. She said, my 14 year old is addicted to pornography. How did that happen? See, he's a very good boy. So they let him take his computer into his room. But you see, those children are not prepared for that roaring lion that is walking about, seeing whom he can devour. It says that in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. So if they have to do computer work, it must be in the lounge room. And mother or father, you're there because you know that one click of the finger and the screen can change, so you're there. So maybe this is when the mother's chopping up the salad. Maybe this is when the father's doing his book work so his eyes can continually flash to see what's on those screens because even the best kids are totally unprepared for the onslaught of the enemy. What do you do when you find out? What does this mother do now she finds out her son is addicted to pornography. Absolutely, the computer must go. Absolutely, take everything away. If he has to do any computer for school, he sits next to mother. And mother might say, I don't have time. You, you do, you must. This is the life of your child here. And then also counsel with the young man, um, talk to him, maybe even get the pastor in and and Maybe he confesses and we ask God to forgive and heal his heart. And then uh, just keep the doors open. It's important that parents listen. In James chapter 1, I think it's verse 19, it says, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And many children stop talking because the parents get angry. Let the children talk. Find out where it's difficult. Find out if there's any areas that are difficult. But that first six months must be very, very diligent. And show them how there's an enemy there <coughs> that is wanting to devour us. And we must resist. Show them the armor of God, that they start memorizing Bible, that they, whenever they feel tempted, show them the story of Joseph who was only a young man when Potiphar's wife tried to take him. And she would have been a very beautiful woman. She would have been very seductive. That would have been even more tempting than seeing it on a screen. And how Joseph, through the grace of God, was able to resist that. To show the young man the stories from the Bible of Joseph, of Daniel, of these young men who only young, away from their homes, away from their parents, and yet they made God their guide. And show them the verse where it says that, uh, Ephesians 3 verse 20, <clears throat> Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And so that's how <clears throat> you help these young people to overcome these temptations. And you can share that because it's the way we overcome our temptations. It's very hard. It's very hard because the children usually have been threatened that they must never tell. So it's very, very hard and it happened in my home. And it happened for many years before I discovered it. And it's because the children were threatened. It's because the they were threatened that if they ever said anything, they would never see me again. They'd be put in a home. And so what you ask me is a very sensitive issue for me. Um, very, very hard. So all you can do is ask by the grace of God that <clears throat> if there's a problem that you might see it, and my, my children told me when we had left home, and I guess they felt safe, and we were able to act um, then, and the abuser was charged and he ended up going to jail. And that is also helpful for the girls um, 
dealing with it and teaching the girls how to forgive and how God can heal. If I'd known, <clears throat> if I'd known it was happening, um, I would have left immediately. But I didn't find out till after I had left. You know, if the grandparents spoil the child, um, then it's time to have a, a conference with the grandparents and to show them how you've worked very hard to train your little one this way. And you would very much appreciate it if they would support that training. And it's very important to them as parents, there must be the mother and the father there, um, for the child not to be fed between meals. And you might make some concessions. You might say, well, if they've already had some water, they could have a fruit juice. So, see, you're bending a little bit there. They're not eating, but it's a liquid. And if the grandparents say, well, it's my grandchild and I can do what I want. And you might say, with all due respect, it is your grandchild. And I'm so glad that my children have you as their grandparents. But if you're going to go against our guidelines, we're going to have to start limiting our visits, which I really don't want to do. So you see what I mean? Now you've got to train the grandparents. <laughs> with what I just shared with you, um, I was a single mother, but it was only me because my first husband had gone to jail. Um, and because of the training that I had done with my children when they were little, it was not difficult for me. See, when you <clears throat> do what we call the hard yards in those early years, then the, latter, then the next years are much easier. And it takes time. It takes time. And a lot of people don't feel they have that time, but you've got to have that time because we've got a saying in Australia, pay now, buy later. Meaning, you might do the easy one now, but you're going to pay for it later. I did the hard yards when they were little. And I certainly reaped the rewards later. And so when Michael and I married, my, my children were 10, 12, 14, 16, 19 and 21. And they have always shown great respect to Michael. And the younger boys certainly love him like their dad because I'd done the hard yards when they were younger. So I didn't realize that that was, that was ahead, but um, it, it certainly made it easier. If, and I know that sometimes it can be very difficult if, <coughs> if there's been a difficult separation and the father wants to do everything against what the mother does, that can be very hard. So it really gets back to the parents. And I say to the parents, you've got to get together. And you've got to work out a way that you're going to be on the same page with these children. I know one young couple, they've separated, they've divorced now, and they have the children 50-50. And when the man gets the children back, the children sleep for two days because they've been on technology half the night. It's very difficult, there's nothing you can do. And if ever he tries to talk to his ex-wife about it, she just gets angry. She says, it's my home and I can do what I want. So he talks to the boys. How old are the boys? 12 and 14 now. And of course, what do they love? Technology. So that's a very difficult one, very difficult. What you can just do is make the best of your situation and pray. <laughs> pray for your children because James chapter 5 says, The effectual, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, of a righteous woman availeth much. And in Adventist home, she says that a child can be just about to fall into sin and the mother's at home praying. And she said, sometimes that can be just enough to pull them back. Well, what I, what I did was we had a really nice little church family. 
and there was another homeschooling family. There are actually two other homeschoolies family with lovely Christian men in it. And so every weekend, in fact all Sunday, we would go with one family and the man would take my son James who was 15 and his son Samuel who was 14, they go surfing. And, and so that was very nice. So I looked for people around me who could be role models for, for my boys. And I, I think that is, that is important. That's, oh, very, that's like? very hard and I have met a couple of women that this has happened to them. Their, their husband was very wealthy. He was able to, uh, he was able to manage to get barristers, you know, the top level of law that managed to win the court case. All a mother can do now is pray. But praying does much and be as nice as possible to her ex-husband, even to say, would you mind if I sent them something? And if he says no, you say, okay. And then maybe a few months later, you try again. <laughs> and if it's still no, you can pray. And when the children are of age, often they search, the, they search their mother out. But that's, that's a very difficult one. And one mother told me she chose to give up her children because her husband was from a very big influential family and the tension was so great and what his family were telling her children about her was so terrible, she just decided to stop. And she gave her children to, to the father and his family. And she just prayed. <laughs> and she, and I, I really admired that woman for, that was a great sacrifice. But she said, I did it for the children. And that's why I say to the adults, please be civil. Please be nice to each other for the sake of the children. So I made a point that even my, even though my first husband had violated the basic laws of decency and what he did to his girls, I have never said a bad word against him, ever. And that's very important. But what I find now is my children have no desire to see him at all. So when my son William was 14, he came to me one day and he burst into tears. I said, what is it? Well, he said, I want to talk to Dad. I said, OK. And I knew he was out of jail. Let's, let's find the number. So I found the number <clears throat> and I gave it to him. And I heard him. I was nearby and I heard him say, yeah, I can drive a car now. Yeah, and I can crack a, crack a whip, Dad. And I can do this and I can do that. And then after half an hour, I said, that's enough. And then a week later, he said, can I ring Dad again? And I said, sure. And I gave him the number. He came, <coughs> he came back into the room about five minutes later, and I said, that was short. He said, oh, his dinner was waiting. I said, oh, there's no more phone calls after that. I thought, your dinner's waiting, and your son <laughs> that you haven't seen for five years. <laughs> but I didn't say a word. I did not say a word because I know that that would have hurt William. I know that would have embarrassed and hurt him. And I needed to respect William and the distance and the space there, and he worked it out. But you see, from me, William never got a bad word ab about that. And that's the only time any of my children have wanted contact. It's perfectly fine. <coughs> In fact, most people don't want to because they realise this man walked out on their mother. <laughs> and I've, ha I've known some men to walk out when the woman first fell pregnant. What if the mother walked out with you? I guess that's something you have to, you have to think about. But I really believe that my children's father is Michael and they call him dad and they have a lovely relationship with him and I thank God that he's always been very good to my children and prayer.
I got that book when my children were raised. I, I read the book. <laughs> but um, I, I know that, um, that even the illustrations that he gives in the book, he said, if your son won't clean his room, get his sisters to clean it and pay them out of his allowance. If your son won't mow the lawn, get the kid next door to mow the lawn and pay them out of his allowance. <laughs> so can you see it's cause and effect? And one farmer told me that his 15 year old daughter, her room was a mess, she wouldn't clean it. So he just unscrewed the door, took the door away. That's what he says in Have a New Kid by Friday. Say it once and then walk away. And if there's no consequence, I mean, if there's nothing happened, then there's a consequence comes in and let the consequence teach them. Because you never nag, because it never does any good. He says words mean nothing. Action, action is everything. And my, <coughs> <coughs> of course the farmer told me that two weeks later he saw the room was clean, so I put the door back on. See, there's not even any need for a dialogue. Because what I say is your children are very smart. Don't tell them the obvious you imply that they're an idiot when you tell them the obvious. You show them great respect when you don't go on and on about it. So often, if a child had done something wrong, I would say something, then I'd say, and I'm not gonna say anything else. And I'd say that to make, to put a hold on my lips. But again, it's just uh, cause and effect. I also wanted to talk a little bit about rescuing children. And I'm going to tell you the story of how I rescued my grandson one night. He was three and his sister's five and they're just going to bed and my the little five-year-old Sophia, she saw a torch. She said, oh, Nana, could I take the torch to bed and then I, I can see when I get up in the night. The torch is a flashlight. Ah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And I immediately looked at Lennox because you have your eye on them the whole time. And his eyes lit up, in other words, he wants a torch. But if the three-year-old goes to bed with a torch, the torch is going to go on, off, on, off, on, off, and he won't go to sleep. So I said to her, no, I'll leave a little side light on and you won't need it. She was a little disappointed, but at five she's used to sometimes disappointments. And then we went into the room and he was... I could see he was upset and he just started to cry. I tried to put him into bed, threw himself on the ground crying and crying. So I ignored him. Sophia was on the top bunk. I kissed her goodnight, we prayed. I went out. He was still crying, not as much, but he's still crying. He's on the floor. And I thought, he needs to be rescued. So I thought, how do I rescue him? I can't go in and say, uh, here's the torch, that'd stop him crying. But no, you give the child nothing they cry for, then you reward that behavior. So I thought, how can I rescue him out of this? So I crawled in on my hands and knees and I pushed the door open with my head and I said, I'm a bulldozer. Oh and I made noises because he loves bulldozers. And he stopped crying. And I made a heavy noise like this. <clears throat> and then I put my head down and I nudged him. And I nudged him, bulldozer. And he started to laugh. And I bulldozed him and I pushed him gently but firmly, rolled him round. And then I, <coughs> and I was able to, Get him up on the bed. This is a bulldozer. And got him into bed and he's giggling now. I didn't say a word. There's no need. And I kissed him goodnight. Mm -hmm. And I asked God to put the angels around him while he slept and I left the room. Sometimes children need rescuing. So <clears throat> what I did was I just helped him get out of that. He didn't get a reward for that behavior. He didn't get the torch, 
which is what he was wanting, that um, I rescued him. And sometimes children need a way out. Mm. Sometimes you can go to them and say, I think that's enough now. So now we'll pick up the things that you dropped and we'll uh, put them in its place and, you know, and, and show, them, show them a way out. Show, show them the next, the next step, the next move. Mm.